Hello and welcome to Vibrant Lives Podcast, a podcast dedicated to your health and well-being, featuring interviews with experts about nutrition, physical health and mental health. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host. I'm a lawyer turned nutritionist and I'm on a quest to learn as much as I possibly can about living a healthy, active and fulfilling life, which I would call a vibrant life, hence the name of this podcast, and sharing what I learn with you. The health and nutrition space can be a confusing one and identifying reliable, trustworthy sources of information is not always straightforward. My aim is to help you do that by speaking with knowledgeable guests who can explain their own area of expertise in an accessible way and provide you with practical tips that you can use to improve your own well-being. Before I introduce today's guest, I'll quickly acknowledge that any information or advice provided in Vibrant Lives podcast is never a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. I think today's episode is a special one. My guest is Veronique Ori, a yoga instructor based in Florida. Before becoming a yoga instructor, Veronique studied theatre in New York and then for 17 years she was the artistic director and producer of her own theatre company, Athena Theatre Company, in New York. So Veronique brings her passion for creativity and storytelling to yoga, which we'll hear about. I say it's a special episode because when I interviewed Veronique, I could truly sense her loving vibes and being in her presence, even though it was digital, it was Zoom in our case, made me feel really good, like she was gifting me some of her positive energy. And I hope that's the same feeling that you get when you listen to this interview. Hi, Veronique. Welcome to Vibrant Lives Podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. Veronique, I'd like to start with some quick fire questions to get to know a little bit about you outside your work as a yoga instructor at Yoga with Veronique in Florida. So, Veronique, where did you grow up? I am originally from Montreal, Quebec, in Canada. And I then moved to the States when I was six years old to a suburb of Albany, New York. And so did all of my schooling in the Albany area. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself as Canadian or American or a bit of a mix between the two? I see myself as, well, my roots and my family are all in Quebec. And so I I regard myself as French Canadian. And then Mm -hmm. I had a green card for years and years and years and then finally became a U.S. citizen in 2007. So I vote and I served on jury duty and I've done the things. um, I haven't really adopted American Thanksgiving. There's certain things that I, I still sort of regard to Canada and then you know, I have a, a, a love for the French language. And so of course. I I love visiting my family and being a part of that culture. And then also I choose to live in the States. And so I've adopted yeah. <laughs> this. So, you know, I hold both passports and. Um, Excellent. Well, it sounds like a feel, wonderful blend. <laughs> yeah. It's good to have um, options. <laughs> oh, I know. We're very lucky if we do have those. Your mm-hmm. favorite form of exercise. Well, I imagine you might guess it would yes. be yoga. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> and and there's different modalities that I like to infuse with that. So I love creative movement and dance and expression through physical embodiment. And so sometimes it looks like traditional forms of Ashtanga or Vinyasa Mm -hmm. or Iyengar or Yin. And then sometimes it's a little bit infused with some strength training or maybe some handstand drills. And so it, you know, depending on how energetic I'm feeling day to day, (laughs) it'll be, it'll be variant depending on, on the mood and what else is going on. And we will obviously talk more to that as the podcast goes on and Veronique your favorite go-to meal for dinner 
sort of a, just a weeknight casual sort of meal, what would you make? Yeah. You know, lately I've been more preferring lunch and uh, actually skipping dinner. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I, and if I do have dinner, I actually like to have something light. So I have a shake recipe that I've sort of finessed and refined over the years that is essentially mixed berries and spinach and uh, vegan protein powder. And I throw in some yummy acai and Mm, coconut dates and different things like that, Mm. pecans. And so it's, it's satisfying and also feels light and energetic. And so that's what I've been sort of as my go-to these days. I think I need to change that question because the previous guest I asked a similar question gave me the same answer that she doesn't actually have dinner. <laughs> so I probably need to say favorite meal, not actually dinner. And what are you enjoying listening to at the moment? It could be an audio book, podcast, music, anything. Yes. So I have discovered this playlist on Spotify called Empowering Women. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And it's wonderful. all of these really great female anthems where you have to turn it up at full volume and (laughs) dance your face off. It's really fun to listen to while you're, you know, doing chores or you're driving and it feels really uplifting. So highly recommend that one. (laughs) Oh, definitely seek that out. It sounds very kind of uplifting and like it will help put you in a good mood and a good frame of mind. So that's always something we like. And your dream holiday destination? Of places that I've been, I would say Costa Rica. And then places that I haven't been, but is very at the top of the list, I'd say Bali. Oh, Bali. Australians go to Bali quite often because it's not so far away. And in fact, my daughter was there last week with some friends and had a wonderful oh time. Mm, they oh, just loved how it. nice. So let's talk about your background and some of the things you did before you became a yoga instructor. So you studied theater at Russell Sage College in New York, and then you worked in this space for many years in both New York and LA. Did you always know that you wanted to work in theater? I did. I have a lot of strong and amazing memories of being a small child in my grandparents' living room, they had gotten a double tape deck and an Elvis Presley microphone for me (laughs) when I was very young. And a lot of our time together, they asked me to put on shows for them. And so I would sing and dance and it would be ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, (laughs) you know, (laughs) welcome to the show. And I would just do random things and They love to play those tapes back when, you know, I wasn't around and it became, I think the seed of what I wanted to do was bringing Mm. people together, making them smile, making them entertained, feeling better. And, and so that was what I was really drawn to. And I knew I wanted to do some kind of performance. I had initially thought it would be film and television and then. I was a teenager and my mom enrolled me into dance and voice and acting at the New York State Theater Institute. And so when I was looking at colleges, I just gravitated to Russell Sage College because it's a small all women's college. It was only a half hour away from where my mom lived at the time. And I was familiar with the campus Mm -hmm. because they had that regional theater on its campus. And so it became like the natural thing to do to yep. study theater, to understand the craft. But I always sort of had in the back of my mind that I was just doing that in order to do film and TV. And then it wasn't until I moved to Los Angeles after college and I started to do film and TV. And I thought, oh gosh, I really miss the craft of theater. Mm-hmm. And so that was the impetus to start my own theater company and really carve space to do all of the shows that I had read in college that I really loved and all of the roles that I thought were just so 
interesting and thought provoking and nuanced and probably like roles that I wouldn't habitually be cast in if it was up to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But I really liked playing things that were against my sort of girl next door sort of type. I like the darker stuff. Wow. (laughs) Which people are sort of surprised to find out about. (laughs) (laughs) So was that the Athena uh, Theatre Company? Yes. That you started. So you were the artistic director and the producer there for, I think, 17 years. Is that right? Yeah, 17 that, years. Oh, uh-huh. What a brave thing to do because you were obviously quite young when you started that. Yes, I was yeah. 22. Wow, that's and amazing. Yeah, I just, one of my good friends from college, Elizabeth Welsh, she had moved out to LA and we both are a sort of personality that isn't for waiting for the phone to ring. (laughs) And so we thought, well, you know, here's a play that we could do. And we thought we would co-produce it and then she would direct it and I would be in it. And, Mm -hmm. and we did that and everything went wrong, but for some reason we thought, well, let's (laughs) start a nonprofit and do this again. And maybe it'll be better (laughs) the next go around as we learn more and um it did wow get better but it also was it was very challenging and I learned a lot and yeah 17 years is a really long time (laughs) it is a long time so can you share with us then some of the highs and, and lows if there were any of your work there at Athena just let us know how it was for you Yeah. I mean, the highs were the actual creation, Mm. everything from the audition process to interviewing designers, bringing everyone together and opening nights and every single performance, it felt very electric and felt Mm -hmm. very much in line with just every cell of my being of yeah. creativity, just feeling super, super fulfilled. I also met a lot of my very good friends yeah. through the theater company and a lot of people who came to see the shows. I'm still very close to people who just randomly found the production or the performance. And then they continued to follow me throughout the years and you know, moments where I would see somebody on the subway and they would recognize me from a wow. show that I had done like three years prior and that they still think about it. Like all of those little moments were just mm. really, really special. Where you really touched um, people. Yeah. And and I think too, like it was nice that people could experience something in a dark room and it's just for them and it's only in that form for that yeah. one night I think that that's really special that that gathering that's you know been at the foundation since we've been around yeah of time gathering memorial together and mm-hmm. sharing in an experience I love that about any form of live entertainment whether it's going to see an orchestra theatre production, there's a room full of people and we're all sharing something together, even though people may be reacting in different ways, but everyone's experiencing emotions and thinking about this, what's in front of them. And I I really love that collective sense of um, anticipation and just being together. And, And that's something so unique, I think, with live performances. Yes, absolutely. It felt like there was a moment sort of in the depths of COVID where it was like, okay, well, we can watch things from the comfort of our home or we could, you know, Mm. watch a filming of a concert. But then as soon as those restrictions lifted and you go to a live show or you go to a live concert, it's like, no, like this is necessary. This is so necessary. It's so much better to have that shared experience, isn't it? I just think it's it, it brings it to life. Mm-hmm. Mm. Absolutely. And what about some of the lows? What were some of the hard things about, um, you know, managing your own theatre company? 
Oh gosh, the personalities of <laughs> people in the industry are very extreme and there's a natural sort of ego and a certain amount of diva kind of <laughs> aspect to people. <laughs> and it's so hard because for many years, and even as the years went on, I was never able to fundraise or get grant support or angel do donors to a level where I was at actually able to pay people enough that they didn't mm. also have to do all of these other things. Yeah. So that was really, that was actually like one of the main reasons why I decided to ultimately close the company is because I really feel for myself personally and for everyone is that I really want to be in the space of thriving, not simply surviving. And I yeah. want to create space where people can thrive, not simply survive. And so, so much of the artist mentality is in that arena and it makes it very difficult to get people to commit to anything, to yeah. be able to basically be on some kind of deadline and you want to be understanding, but then of course, you know, running a company, there are certain deadlines that have to be yes. in place in order to be ready for opening night. And so there was just a lot of stress wow. and it, you know, unfortunately there just isn't arts funding in mm. a way that is, is allowing for the off Broadway or the off off Broadway, like those levels of theater, unless you have, you know, connections to yeah. people who are, you know, completely just excited to support you um, and have, you know, an, a bottomless bank account. Yeah. It's, you know, it makes it difficult if you're, you know, trying to sew a quilt of a hundred dollar donations here and there, oh, you know, good, to yeah. be able to operate at the level that, you know, I had envisioned for my company. So that, that made it very challenging. Yeah, so it was, like, it was the money piece and then how that kind of affected, you know, being able to manage the, the so people. So difficult. <laughs> I think I worked in a not-for-profit art space for a while. And when you're in the arts, well, for me anyway, I didn't like the fundraise. It was a necessary evil. You had to do it. But I found it so tricky and I, I just, that was the ultimate reason I stopped working in that space as well because the job became very much about fundraising and I just, not only did I not like doing it, I wasn't very good at it either. <laughs> it's tricky, so isn't it? So hard. Yeah. It's very tricky. It's very, mm. even if you have a track record of successful grants, mm. it doesn't mean that they're going to award you the grant the next yeah. cycle. Which, as you so said, it, was stressful. And so during your career there, you discovered yoga. So how did yoga did. come into your life? Yes. So I was living in New York and Hurricane Sandy came through. And, you know, it's a really big deal when mm. the subways close and Broadway closes and a lot of the businesses closed. And it wasn't until maybe two or three days after the hurricane that people started to emerge out of their apartments. And my roommate at the time said, oh, you know, the yoga studio in town opened up. Do you want to go take a class today? And I just thought, okay, like he could have literally said anything. Like, do you want to go, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. And I would have been yeah. game just to get out of the apartment. And so we went and it was one of those moments of clarity where wow. I felt this is how I want to feel all of my days. It was this really nice vinyasa class that ended with 30 minutes of restorative and you just left there floating. And I went to the front desk afterwards and signed up for a monthly unlimited pass. And I told them that I would be there every day and I'm here, you know, to experience this always. And it became this really nice anchor for me because I, I started to 
really tune into the fact that being in New York City, it rattled my nervous system. Mm, mm. It is very hard to not let the energy of that city in on extended periods of time. I think when I'm there for a short period of time, I feel it as energetic. But when you're living in it, (laughs) it becomes or it could become stress inducing and anxiety ridden. And I started to feel that really profoundly that coupled with just the constant rejection and pounding the pavement and having to commute here and there and everywhere there was just like a lot of energy output yes. and so I found the yoga practice to be incredibly grounding and liberating a space where I was able to connect with my breath and practice letting go of feeling happy contingent on other people's approval yeah. or other people's validation or just feeling accepted or something like that so it it became like a very big eye opening awakening to these really extreme highs and lows that i was riding of within a day i could you know get a really great mm. review on a play that i was in and then like find out that this tv that show that i auditioned for i didn't get even though like they seemed like they loved me or you know what i mean all of these things yeah, so you could be like so- an extreme jubilation and then like bawling your eyes out on the kitchen floor the next moment. And it, it feels like you're sort of like riding these emotional toddler (laughs) ranges of motion. Yoga sort of for you was like finding a kind of equanimity, a sort of a balance between like maybe flattening out those curves somewhat. Absolutely. And also just this really deep knowing that ultimately true happiness and what we would say in yoga is this practice of santosha or contentment that this is something that we all have the power to tap into Mm -hmm. within us that doesn't need to be contingent on the relationship or the work or all of these external circumstances we think that it is Like we think like, oh, I'll be happy when when Mm. these things work out. But it's a bit of a fallacy because everything is impermanent and change is the only constant. And so if we can be in that, what you're talking about is like more of a state of equilibrium, then these things can happen to us and we're more adept at rolling with it. Or maybe it doesn't penetrate so much. And, you know, we all have our triggers and we all have I'm not even like speaking like oh I never get upset anymore that's not it at all (laughs) it's more like I'm a lot more aware of when that's happening and then just being a lot more mindful of when I'm sort of steeping in those dark places and being really mindful of guiding myself out of those places. So do you think that you're more able to look at external circumstances and say, okay, that's happened. Now my reaction is going to be, you know, you you sort of have more control over your reaction rather than just um, letting things happen to you for want of a better expression. Absolutely. There's so much power in the breath and taking a pause. I'm a big fan at like letting an emotionally triggered email sit for 24 hours and not feel like I have to knee jerk react, respond to things in the moment. I think this modern culture, like it feels like we need to respond to things faster than we actually do. And especially if we feel like we're sort of um, provoked in a sense, oftentimes in these moments of stillness and allowing things to sit, then we can better manage how we're showing up and how we're responding. And, and that, I mean, that takes practice. That's like a muscle that, that needs to be focused on, or, you know, that you need to practice. Constantly, really. It's a lifelong constantly. Practice, isn't it? Yeah, it's a it's a lifelong yeah. journey. Uh-huh. So 
Obviously, yoga brings a lot to your life. That's very clear from how passionately you speak about it. So why did you decide to take your personal love of yoga beyond your own practice and qualify as a teacher? Yes. Oh, goodness. So I was practicing regularly for five years before I did my first yoga teacher training. And the previous year or two before I finally did my first yoga teacher training, I started to hear from people who I was practicing with or from other teachers saying, you know, we really think that you should be a yoga instructor. And I would always say, oh, no, 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 I really love this. I don't want it to be a job. I was really concerned that it would taint Mm -hmm. the joy and the magic of it if I was on the other side of it, because I witnessed that for myself with theater, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, you can see a show and see it from a certain lens if you're not in the industry. But if you're in the industry, you sort of can kind of see behind the curtain, so to speak, and you're noticing things that it takes you out of the magic of it a little bit because you're probably paying attention to things (laughs) that are maybe distracting. You know too much, don't you? The intention is, yeah, you know too much. And so I resisted it for many years. And then I had this moment, I was taking... I used to go to this hot yoga class when I was still in the city and it was this really tight knit group. It was like always the same people. So you're always practicing next to the same people and your mats are, you know, two inches apart, (laughs) like packed (laughs) in like sardines. And, and I just had this moment of clarity where I thought I'm not in competition with any of these people. I feel the most joyful when I'm here. I'm getting creative, that creative outlet by moving my body and listening to the music and being a part of the storytelling. And I was able to practice with some incredible teachers that inspire a lot of the language that Mm -hmm. I use and the style that I use. And so I started to feel like it was almost like that moment of reckoning from Hurricane Sandy where I was like, oh, maybe I want to actually live this, like have it be my livelihood. Like, why do I have to compartmentalize like, oh, my vocation is stressful. (laughs) And this other thing that I do is bringing me joy. Like maybe my entire life could be filled with joy. And so that, that was something that I had, thought about. And then I had signed up for a yoga retreat. My mom and I have a tradition where we go to a different yoga retreat in different places all over the world. And it's a nice mother daughter Mm. bonding experience, which is really nice. And so we had chosen to go to this yoga retreat at Blue Spirit in Costa Rica, led by Courtney Ostrowski, who's since become a good friend of mine. And my mom, as I was telling her that I was thinking about a yoga teacher training, she says, well, you know, Blue Spirit is this world-renowned retreat center. Maybe they have a yoga teacher training there. And then sure enough, we look at the calendar and the week before our yoga retreat is a 100-hour intensive yoga teacher training led by Amazing Yoga. And they're based in Pittsburgh of all places. And they're (laughs) going to be in Costa Rica doing this intensive. And I thought, I have to sign up for this. And so I did. And it was one of those, again, life changing experiences. Some of my greatest friends I met during that yoga teacher training, and it, it really catapulted things in the best possible way towards that trajectory. Wow. You know, your stories that you're telling, what I'm hearing is it's so interesting. You're, you're very open to things, aren't you? You are very open to new experiences and trying things and, you know, welcoming in new experiences. I love that. Thank you. It's fun to be curious. Yeah, of course, (laughs) of course. So before we move on to more about your work as a yoga teacher, what do you think in a general sense for anyone who does yoga, what are some of the benefits? Oh, goodness, they're endless. There's so much... There's so much. I mean, on the surface, it's increased 
flexibility and increased strength. It's your awareness of your body in space. It, you know, it could be mending old injuries, both physical and emotional. It could be this huge empowerment of this deep reckoning that all the things that you thought you weren't able to Mm -hmm. do that all of a sudden with consistency, with attention, now you're able to do those things. And if you're able to do those things on a yoga mat, what else are you able to do off of the mat? So I'm really, I love that on the mat, off the mat connection of these things that we practice of the breath and noticing the thoughts and this space of self-inquiry in this pocket of movement or breath practice or meditation and how can that apply when you're having maybe an emotionally charged conversation with your partner or your loved one or your kids or you're driving and someone cuts you off you know what I mean like where does the line of the yoga start and end and my hope is that there's there's no beginning and Mm. end that there can be this continuous practice in all that we do so that the way that we're showing up when we're checking out at the grocery store that it it's in conversation with how it is we're showing up on the yoga mat and so on so you know it's it's often said you know the way that you do something is the way that you do everything Mm. and so it's really interesting to watch that right so it's like are you doing this yoga practice and then like immediately going and eating fast food and drinking all the things which you know I'm not saying that in the space of judgment but you know it's just in the space of observing how I think sometimes our like inner teenagers like oh like I did this good thing and now I get to do this bad thing for some reason and so it's like kind of unpacking like where those thought patterns are coming from and like what it is that you get to do and how can the things that you get to do actually be in support of the longevity of your mind, Mm. your body, your Mm. spirit, all of it. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful answer. It's you're saying that you don't compartmentalize yoga as that thing you do for one hour um, every day. It's, it's becomes part of your your life and the way you think and the way, as you say, the way you show up to life. Let's talk a bit about your own philosophy and yoga teaching style. I believe that you like teaching yoga in a creative way and that you like to weave in your passion for storytelling. So tell us about that. Yes, I love connecting the seed of what I'm going through into the yoga practice, because oftentimes what one person is going through is connected to what another person is going through. And so oftentimes the feedback I get is, how did you know that I needed to hear that today? And it's because we're all connected, yeah. right? Like what connects us is much greater than what divides us. And I, I really strongly believe that when we show up in that space of receptivity, we get the messages that we are intended to receive. Mm-hmm. And so I love finding a thoughtful way to just plant these seeds. So it's not overt. I'm not giving unnecessary personal details about my life (laughs) you know it's it's more of I I give like a little taste in a space where it's universal and so people can see themselves in Mm. that situation and then they can do their own self-reflection on how that's playing a role in their life and then as they're moving their bodies they're able to kind of feel it in a different way than if they were maybe just listening to the story or if they were just reading the story, they're able to embody it in a way that they can actually pass the energy through or maybe like let go of Mm -hmm. kind of blocked energies that maybe they weren't even consciously aware that they were holding on to. Uh, You mentioned blocked energies. So I know that one of the things you're passionate about is helping students um, unlock their blockages, both physical and mental. 
So how does yoga do that? Can you talk to us a bit about that? Yes. So one of the examples that comes to mind is I was leading a yoga practice and the theme was self-love. And so I planted the seeds of how that could mm-hmm. show up with each person throughout the practice. And then towards the end of the practice, I guided everyone into pigeon pose. And so if anyone is unfamiliar, <laughs> you're basically with one leg forward and the front knee is bent and then the back leg is extended. And so you're getting really a nice deep yeah. hip stretch. It's a hard and one. And so oftentimes it's a hard yeah. one. <laughs> So oftentimes we talk about our emotions being stored in our hips. And so it's quite common that if you're moving through something, you might be in pigeon pose and find yourself crying and not really know why. And so I had everyone in pigeon pose and I asked the rhetorical question of name all the people that you love, or maybe, you know, think about the people that you love, something like that. And then I let that sink in, you know, they're holding the Mm -hmm. pose for maybe 10 breaths. And so allowing for that pause, and then asking, how long does it take for you to name yourself? Mm, That's so interesting. And it, and it hits home yeah. because you don't really think about naming yourself in that instance. And, and I had this one woman come up to me after class with tears in her eyes. And she said, I never think of myself in the space of loving myself. And it, and it opened up this, this space that she didn't think was possible. And now she's open to it. Oh, what a gorgeous story. I love that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's it's really powerful. There's, I mean, there's so many opportunities for that, like these deep yeah. reckonings or like these deep transformations of, oh my gosh, I've been living my life for however many decades and I never thought of, you know, whatever the thing in this way. Yeah. And now, and now that I'm awakened to this, like, what is possible? Yeah, where can it take me? How can it help me? Before I continue my chat with Veronique, I want to let you know about a very special women's only event, As Bear As You Dare, to be held on Saturday the 4th of February in Adelaide. So you might recall one of my earliest guests was Sarah Lee in episode 36 back in March 2020. And Sarah inspired us with her story of taking up running during her chemotherapy treatment for breast cancer, and Sarah went on to run numerous marathons. Sadly, this year Sarah's cancer has returned in her liver and in her spine. Her best hope for treatment is a new drug known as NHER2. NHER2 is not available on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, but it could buy Sarah precious time to spend with her loved ones. It does come at a staggering cost, though, of about 12300 per treatment. So by stripping down to as bare as you dare, which could be in your bathers, topless, or the full nudie, if you dare, you can join this body image-inspired women's-only event of a sunset dash and splash to fundraise for a worthy cause – And your entry fee and any sponsorships you collect will help Sarah continue her expensive drug treatment and fuel her race against time. If you register by the 31st of December, the early bird fee is $75 and after that it's $100. I'll put a link to the booking in the show notes. So come on ladies, let's be brave and support a wonderful woman who has always made time to support others. Another thing you say is you like to inspire your students to shine their light, which sounds beautiful. So what does that mean for people to shine their light? 
Yes. So we all enter into this world as light beings and our soul and our natural state of vibrancy is ever present before we learn not to be, right? Like Mm -hmm. depending on our upbringing, depending on our social circles, there might be things that happen that for a sense, there's a dimming of that light or there's a playing small or feeling like we can't show up maybe too exuberant or too, you know, whatever the thing that maybe we didn't get validation for, or maybe we even got chastised or bullied about. And so what I feel is really, really important, especially, I mean, I feel like we could perpetually say, especially now, but also especially now, you know, there's so much media that is fear inducing yeah. where it, it can be completely debilitating where you just feel like, oh my gosh, I, I can't move because there's so much oppression Suffering. in different regards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, you you know, you could turn on the news at any yeah. moment and, and convince yourself there's no reason to get out of bed. And so, you know, the things that we put our attention to, those things magnify. And so when we put our attention to shining our light, and so, you know, tuning into your own natural state of vitality and vibrancy that you know that you were born with, it's your birthright to shine as children do, to illuminate a room Mm -hmm. and and I and I really love this idea that we are surrounding ourselves with people whose eyes light up when they see us and that like our eyes light up when we see them so there there it's a it's a conversation that we're in communion with and and the the intention with that is that it has this really powerful ripple effect right so if you're showing up and you're shining your light it becomes contagious. And then, you know, I want to show up and shine my light and so on and so on. And so it's, it, it can have this really powerful impact on, on the world at large, this attention to peacefulness Mm -hmm. of that deep joy. Like I had mentioned before, this detachment of the exterior and really tuning into okay, what are the things that light me up that I can maybe tap into that dream holiday and I can close my eyes and visualize myself. I don't actually need to go to Bali to like feel this. Mm. I could, but there's, there, you can kind of comb through the layers and be like, okay, what is this thing? You know, and you can look at this, what, whatever obstacles are inhabiting you, like, oh, I'll feel happy when I lose 20 pounds or when my relationship is better, you know, whatever the thing is that feels like the the physical or the emotional barrier, how can I get to the, the base layer of it in a way that I actually can harness in the here and the now? And so, you know, for like the weight loss, you know, example, it's like, okay, well, I could translate that into, I want to feel light. I want to feel energetic. I want to feel vibrant. Like what's something that I can do in this present moment that just like moves the needle a little bit. So it doesn't seem like, oh my gosh, I have these huge goals and it's so far away. And how could I possibly harness this? It's like, okay, maybe if I breathe in a different way, I can tap into it. Or maybe if I you know, for example, have a smoothie for dinner, I can, you know, get a little bit closer to it, you know, so there's these different things that I feel we can embody. And like you were saying before, it's a forever journey. So, you know, we might have moments where we feel like our light is being dimmed, and we're kind of like into like a dark pocket. But the hope is, over time and with practice more and more we can be shiny and vibrant as yeah. much as possible and also that awareness i think is so important so even if you're in a state where you feel like your light is being dimmed 
if you're actually aware of that happening, that makes you more likely to be able to move away from that feeling and, you know, find your light again. So you obviously uh, think a lot about your teaching and the way you deliver it. And clearly you have a passion for it. That just is coming through. So what has being an instructor taught you, do you think? Mm. So much. I think it's taught me patience and understanding and being receptive and also not taking things personally and to have a lot of time for silence. Mm -hmm. I think when one starts teaching maybe almost anything, it's like we have all of this information and we think, oh my gosh, I have to relay all of this (laughs) all at once. And and oftentimes it's too much. You know, you can't cover all the sutras and the anatomy and physiology and the alignment of all of the poses in one practice I mean it would just be overwhelming it wouldn't be yoga then would it <laughs> it would be like a lecture no, no it would be it would be yeah it would be more like like a crash yeah. course and <laughs> in yoga teacher training or something and so I am very mindful of saying just the right amount and allowing for space. Um, there's there's been different styles that have influenced me. I, I think a lot of instructors prefer to like write out their sequences, mm-hmm. and I did that in my yoga teacher training. But I found that as I became a teacher full time that doesn't serve me I'm better to think of the theme and then I feel the energy in the room and and then or if it's a private client I specifically ask what are you craving in this moment what is your intention in this moment and so I'm intuiting the sequence in the moment so it's not pre-crafted And so that has been really liberating in terms of creating unique offerings every single time. And then also it's, it's, uh, I think a certain sense of memory practice. So I might do like this very like complicated sequence on the right side and I have to remember (laughs) every single nuance of that once we get to the second side (laughs) there's um a huge amount of presencing I I often say that it becomes an extended meditation practice for me that I'm really really hyper focused and present with each person because my intention is for them to feel seen and heard and nourished and nurtured and to feel like they could float out of there and and essentially like remove the obstacles so that when they're coming out of the practice that they are as radiant as Mm. they've ever been and so that has been a cultivation of over the years of arriving to that and and so it's it's taught me a great deal and I think Two, it's, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize what you have left to learn. Yes. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's always, there's more, always to, more to learn. to find out about. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I really like the way you um, use your intuition to teach yoga because, I mean, clearly to get to a point where you can actually do that, you, you need to have a very solid grounding in understanding all the poses um, so for someone taking their first ever yoga class, that would probably be too difficult to do. But years of practice and you can really feel what your clients need and guide the practice in that way. I think that's really beautiful. And what a wonderful talent you have for that. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it it's really grown and evolved over the years. And the the other liberating piece about it is I used to feel like I had to demonstrate a certain amount. And I almost never demonstrate anymore. I'm specifically verbally cueing people through the practice, Mm -hmm. especially if I'm teaching via Zoom, I'm sitting like I am with you now, and I'm just talking them through it. And so that's been really great, just getting really specific with the language. And and also, I, I love that they know that my attention is fully on them. I think it would be very difficult for me to be, you know, way away from my device and also doing the practice and kind of out of the corner of my eye trying to see what they were doing. So I think, you know, just the more focus in general, I I find is is really nice. It it, it feels really grounding. And it must take a certain level of confidence to do that because I imagine um, when you start teaching yoga, you almost feel like you need to show your students that you know how to do it. Like, look, look, I know how to do this pose. And (laughs) so being able to step back from that and really focus on your students is, I think, uh, an incredible skill and one that I'm sure they must appreciate as well. Yeah, it's, it's nice. And it's, I think um, there's, there's also a gift in that too, because sometimes, especially if, if someone is just starting a yoga practice, their tendency is they want to just follow along, like, like it's a fitness class, like, oh, like, I just want to copy what it is that you're doing. And my hope Uh, with the non-demonstrating is that you can interpret my words and find the shape or the transition or the movement in a way that is your interpretation. It's your creative expression. And so it's not necessarily like, oh, this is the right way to do it, or this is the wrong way to do it. I mean, there, there's a safety attention in terms of, you know, if someone's going to fall or something but in terms of you know so specific with alignment that's not something that I think you know someone needs to be looking in the mirror looking at someone demoing and trying to like copy it directly I think for for me personally it's it's a meditative practice and so letting go of trying to mimic my version of say warrior one you know, it, it is, it could be something that you would want to see maybe once to just be like, okay, but maybe not necessarily feeling like you have to copy or mimic me or, you know, somebody else. Um, I think it's nice to also have time where you're not trying to mold yourself yeah. into what you think it should be and it's nice to close your eyes and embody and it in a feel. way that actually yeah that yeah. it feels good in your body and, and you're the only one that knows that I know and everyone's body is so different and when you do go into a yoga class and we are all trying to do the same pose we all look completely different don't we because you know, mm-hmm. someone might have tight hips, someone might have a sore shoulder or whatever it is. You just, you have to arrive at the pose in a way that um, suits your own body. Absolutely. Absolutely. Veronique, you've released your first book, Shine On and Off the Mat. So congratulations. But I think calling it a book in quotes might be a little bit of a disservice because it sounds like there's more to this than just being something that someone would pick up and read. So tell us about it. Uh, How did it come about? What's it about? Yeah, I'd love to hear about it. Yes. So for years, I would be out and about and a student might come up to me and say, 
the story that you told in class the other day, I keep thinking about it. And it actually, it, it's funny that it's a little bit of an echo of my theater background of, you know, having that moment where someone is continuing to think about the thing after they've experienced it. And so um, I started to write down my stories as a way to maybe have it as a personal memoir or a journal. And I started writing them down seven weeks before the pandemic. And I thought, you know, I would just have it as a collection or something. I didn't really have a vision to publish a book per se. And then when all the yoga studios shut down mm. in March of 2020, I decided that I wanted to create an on-demand platform where I could have an echo of the themes that I was introducing in my group classes and have three 20 minute practices underneath the same theme. And so it, it's a 20 minute guided meditation, a vinyasa movement practice mm -hmm. and a yin stretching practice. And you could do all three back to back for a 60 minute practice or if you don't have 60 minutes at any time, the thought is, you know, you can break it up during the week or during the day as you have the space to do so. And also you could just do the style that resonates with you. And so as I started putting that together, I was simultaneously writing these entries and, and kind of distilling at the end of the week, these overarching themes that were resonating in my group classes, because before COVID, I had 17 group classes all over town at all of the studios, any place that offered yoga, I was teaching there. And so each week had a theme. And then depending on the studio or the style of class, the sequence, or maybe the essence of the physical practice shifted, but it was all under the same theme mm -hmm. for that week. And so I thought, oh, maybe this could be an interactive yoga book where I could have my stories and they could connect with my videos. And then I always get a lot of great feedback on my music playlist. And so I included my Spotify playlist on there so that, you know, you could do each of these elements separately you could do all of them it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure of the the things that resonate for you and then the hope is that you can do it year after year and then there's journal entries after each theme story so that you can start to see okay what is shifting in my life what feels constant or what am i ready to shift and you can start to really look at these themes in a universal way and, and take my experience as a gateway into your own reflection, your own self-growth journey wow. and, and see that there's, there's ways to continue to practice that curiosity that sounds incredible. Like what a lot to offer. And if someone would like to buy that book, Shine On and Off the Mat, where's the best place for them to do that? Yes. So I have select advanced copies still available. So if you feel like you'd love an inscribed book, I am happy to mail that out. You can direct message me mm -hmm. on Instagram. I'm at Veronique hyphen Ori and you can I'll put a link spell it in the show notes. Link in the show yes. notes yeah. <laughs> and then if you want to order it directly through Amazon or Book Baby or Barnes and Noble, it's also available there that you can get a hard copy. And it's a coffee table style book. So it's it's almost, you know, like a yearbook sized book hardcover with really great photography by my friends Shaz and Jeff. But it's all pictures of different yoga poses on the Jacksonville beach in Florida. Wow. And 
How gorgeous. Yeah, so it's it's a it's it's a it's nice so it's it has the photography with the stories and so you can very easily skim through it or you can really pour into mm. it that was the hope is that you know you can utilize it in a way that services you so it's it's not meant to be like this additional add-on like sometimes we get these books and it's like, oh my gosh, now I have all this homework. homework yeah. <laughs> it's not like that. At, <laughs> I know it's not like that at all. It's You can let these stories wash over you. If you want to write a few words on the journal prompt, it it should be in the space of enhancing your life and, and moving you along. And so you can spend a few minutes doing it or you could spend hours doing it depending on you mm. know how much you want to dive in. Um, one of the, um, oh, and yes. then oh, sorry, I just wanted to continue. So, so you could also get the ebook on on Amazon okay. as well if you prefer to to not have paper. Right, <laughs> I do like the sound of the coffee table book and the photos. That sounds gorgeous. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is that you would often pick a theme for a week when you're teaching several classes. So, can you give us an example of what a theme might be? Yes. So. I start the book with the theme, let go, which seems to be an ever present, always timely and timeless theme. One of the themes is slowing down. I really love that one. It's one that I come back to personally. I think it's easy to sort of get on the gerbil wheel of life and go round and round and round and get at a pace and you sort of don't know how to yeah. stop. And so there, there's that exercising of that muscle of intentional slowing down. And I talk about that in the book of, you know, this slowing down that is by happenstance. So it, you know, it happens in a global pandemic, yeah. it happens in natural disasters, it happens if you have a trauma, you if sick. you're injured, if you're sick. Mm all of those things. And so when we can have that agency in our life to take rest on purpose versus being forced like to. forced yeah. rest and then you're you're resentful about it. Yeah. <laughs> if we can actually take a holiday on purpose, if we can actually, you know, two o'clock on a Wednesday randomly we just decide to close our eyes for 20 minutes these things have tremendous results on the way that we're operating in the world and and the nervous yeah. system regulation that that we're able to manage as well and stress obviously can help uh-huh uh-huh i could talk to you all day but i'm sure you've got things to do so <laughs> it's time to start wrapping up this beautiful conversation and I just have to notice on, or mention that you're a dog lover. Your dog's been, um, I've seen him on the screen. You've been um, patting him and he's been on your lap, which is very cute. Uh, so tell us about your dog. Yes, his name is Bowery. He's named after a street in New York. And um, he's Frenchton. It's a mix between French Bulldog and Boston Terrier. He's very loving and he's so cute. Telling me that his stomach alarm is going off <laughs> ever since daylight savings. He's oh. not very aware that dinner is now <laughs> not as early as he wants it to be. So, um, yeah, he's very playful. It's a really nice mix of, of the French bulldog and Boston Terrier. He's cute. Um, 30 pounds he's he's like I think a good mixture of like playful lap dog and uh he's got a I can't see um on the screen at the moment but I notice he has a, a top on like a coat or something does it say anything on that oh oh my goodness yeah so <laughs> it says straight out of the dog park <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a play on straight out of Compton. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar yes. with. Yeah. So. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Veronique, who inspires you? Oh, my. I'm inspired by my students, my clients for showing up, 
consistently and courageously and inspired by my parents who instilled so much independence and resilience in me and inspired my by my grandfather who was the original storyteller in my family he always had amazing stories and was the <laughs> the man at wherever we would go he would just start launching into a story that he had in his mind to whoever would listen and so <laughs> it was it was a really amazing way to grow up I'm inspired by Audrey Hepburn she's one of my original influences to embodiment of grace yeah. and beauty from the inside and in all that I do and I just so admire all of the work that she did with UNICEF and this incredible attention to leaving the world better than how she found it. And that feels like a really beautiful and strong principle that I, I aspire to live by. In fact, on that note, you're very passionate, I know, about the environment. So how do you put or what are some of the ways that you put that passion into practice? Mm -hmm. I am very diligent about seeking out ways to avoid single use items. Yeah. So, you know, small things are, I, I love the stasher silicone bags instead of Ziploc yeah. or plastic bags, um, glass or metal straws instead of the plastic straws you know if I'm out to eat I don't take the straw you know different yeah. things like that um I don't use napkins I have cloth napkins there's you know these little things that we can do that can add up to really big changes and so I really love to find different ways to repurpose or to let go of waste in any way. It's, it's um, so important for, for us all to start changing our habits, I think, in that way. Absolutely. And the final question that I like to ask all of my guests is if you could recommend two things that people could do to improve their well-being, any two things at all, what would they be? Mm, goodness, just two things is so hard. <laughs> it is hard, isn't it? <laughs> I would say, firstly, to start each day connecting to yourself in some way. So oftentimes I've witnessed, particularly in modern times, that a lot of people they use their phone for an alarm. And so they might embed just like launch into their emails or social media or start messaging people. I think the more that we can ignore our devices until we've centered ourselves and that could be meditation. It could be taking yourself for a walk, going to the beach or to the mountains, finding a peaceful spot mm. for you to connect with yourself, even for five minutes can be hugely transformative in your day. So it's this idea of filling your cup up before you're able to offer to others. Yeah. And that could be, you know, to your kids or to your partner or to your work or, you know, yeah. however you're showing up in the world. It, I think that piece right there is really, really important. And then the other one I would say would be a bit more of an umbrella something. It would be a mindfulness practice in something. And so maybe each of your listeners could think about something that they do on a daily basis that they maybe dread or they multitask on or they are avoiding and thinking about a way to bring joy and radiance mm -hmm. to that and so if that 
is an errand or a chore or maybe it's you know the the rushed lunch yeah. as they're also doing emails things like that like how can you choose one thing each day that you are mindful with so a commitment to being present doing the thing yeah. and also making it more like how can you make this more fun so that like the things that we have to do we can reframe yeah. like I get to do this thank you so much for coming on vibrant lives podcast today I've just loved our conversation you've got so much to offer um and so oh, thank you if people would like to follow what you're doing buy your book um what's the best way for them to do that so I have all of my offerings on my website, mm -hmm. yogawithveronique.com. Okay, I'll link that in the show notes. And I have information on my book, my upcoming yoga retreat in Costa Rica Ooh, next year, wow. and a new program I'm launching with my business partner, Erin, in the new year. And I have information of if you wanted to book a private session with me different things like that so we can connect that way you can click the contact me button and then you could also feel free to connect with me on instagram as well so can people do a say someone that's not in florida do a class with you via zoom for example Absolutely. In fact, most of my clients are not in Florida. I do most of my sessions via Zoom, which has been one of the silver linings of this time, yeah, is has. realizing that we don't have to live in the same city to connect. Yeah, that's actually been one of the few good things to have come out of the pandemic, hasn't it? This ability like we're doing right now to connect with people in different time zones, different countries. It's um, it's actually been um, a really wonderful if we're looking for something positive out of COVID that's one thing perhaps <laughs> absolutely absolutely excellent well thank you so much and that was the lovely Veronique Ori yoga instructor at Yoga with Veronique in Florida and I do hope that you enjoyed the episode today and thank you so much for listening if you did please share the podcast and tell your friends about it because Word of mouth is still one of the best way for people to find out about Vibrant Lives podcast. You can follow me on Instagram at vibrant underscore lives underscore podcast or on Facebook at Vibrant Lives podcast. And please check out my website at vibrantlivespodcast.com. There you'll find a library of all my previous podcast episodes and reviews of books about health that I recommend. You can also subscribe to my monthly newsletter where I keep you up to date with health and wellbeing news. And please feel free to DM me or contact me via my website and let me know what you'd like to hear more of or if you'd like to just say hi, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. I have another great episode for you next week. I'll be speaking with psychotherapist Marie Rowland and we'll be talking about how to build emotional immunity, which is probably a great thing to listen to just before we launch into the craziness of the Christmas season. Thank you again for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well, live vibrantly.